Okay, so uh, today uh, I'm going to present uh, Veracruz, which is a uh, project within ARM Research. Uh, it's basically privacy preserving multi party computation using trusted hardware. And uh, first, I'm going to start with talking about our team members. Uh, not everybody on this list here is uh, full time. We've got a few part time people uh, who are working on other projects. And I do have to point out that Hugo is uh, more of a, uh, well, he's sub submitted quite a bit of code, but he's mostly a technical advisor. Um, and the team is uh, split between uh, Cambridge in the United Kingdom and uh, in Austin in the United States. Although, as one note, Nick is currently trapped in Boston. But anyway. So uh, first, Veracruz, the Veracruz framework. It's a framework to, for defining flexible and efficient multi-party computations. We aim to... Uh, you, uh, to support the use cases for techniques like homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party computation, um, basically multiple inputs, uh, multiple multiple distrusting parties. But unlike homomorphic encryption or secure multi-party computations, we, we aim to be efficient, we wanna be fast, uh, and we wanna be familiar. We wanna allow you to program in whatever language that you are most comfortable with. And uh, within reason, I guess, I guess we're not going to support PHP, but I mean, that's up to you. And uh, so we want to be general. So we basically seamlessly want to support a large class of computations and we want to be reusable. Uh, this is kind of important because of uh, the multi-platform form support. Uh, I'll get a little bit later how we support ARM and SGX platforms. And we want the, uh, the, the, the Enclave code that you write to be reusable across those platforms. So, and with all of that, we use to, we hope to use TEEs to provide strong security and privacy guarantees. So practically speaking, just the nuts and bolts here, uh, we have been provisionally open source with the Confidential Computing Consortium. Uh, we are open sourced, but we are still provisional with the, with the CCC, uh, mostly because of lawyers. That's really what it comes down to. So uh, the project is mostly written in Rust. There's some C in the project, and uh, usually those are a bit legacy type things. And then there's some C in the dependencies. For example, uh, we use uh, Russell's and, and Ring for our cryptography, and Ring has some C in its dependencies, or at least the version we, we're using does. And we hope to use, and we are using actually currently, Intel SGX, ARM Trust Zone, and AWS Nitro Enclaves. Um, and uh, for the runtime environment, in order to get the... Uh, cross-platform support, we use uh, WebAssembly. So uh, we've got all the hashtags that, uh, you know, all, all the kids are looking for these days. So a uh, quick overview of Veracruz from about 50,000 feet. We have data inputs to Veracruz. These can, can originate from different agents. These agents could be mutually distrusting. Uh, they just need to rely, uh, share a trust in the platform being it's being executed on and um, have been able to audit the Veracruz runtime software. And additionally, we have the program input. This may originate from another agent. And one of uh, the key points of Veracruz is that we allow this program to be confidential. Uh, we allow it, but we don't require it. And uh, this, this program is uh, compiled to WebAssembly. On the platform where we're executing, we've got the untrusted host and the trusted execution environment inside that host. And we've got our Veracruz runtime code running inside that TEE. Inside that TEE is a policy which details all the roles and identities of everyone involved in the computation, describes who can receive the result. Um, it gives you hashes for the expected Veracruz value, uh, the, the, the expected Veracruz runtime, and uh, the expected hash of the program being loaded. And that policy right now is a JSON file. You may ask why we use JSON. There's not a great reason. We just used it. So uh, the program and the data, they're provisioned securely using a TLS that is terminated inside the TEE into, uh, into Veracruz. Um, and then inside Veracruz, the, the, compu the result is computed. And then the result can be retrieved by an entity specified in the policy file. Identities in that policy file are, take the form of self-signed x.509 certificates. Just, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, additionally, we, to maintain secrecy, we also need to control the expressivity of the program and the capabilities of its environment. And that's another part where WebAssembly becomes really useful because of uh, the, the sandboxing aspects of it. And we also get to very closely control uh, its interface to the outside world. So a bit on the platforms we support and the ways that we're supporting those platforms. 
Um, uh, we've got ARM Trust Zone, Intel SGX, and AWS Nitro Enclaves. And then um, also uh, in a uh, experimental branch, we've got a, uh, support for the high assurance SCL4 micro kernel, which was uh, developed in mostly Australia. And uh, this is a, the SCL4 micro kernel is uh, formally verified. It's not the same as the other hardware um, enclaves, and it doesn't provide you the same protections. But it is uh, an interesting uh, support model for various reasons. If you want to know, I can talk about them offline. So now Trust Zone, of course, naturally, I'm ARM. We have to talk about Trust Zone. Uh, if you're familiar with Trust Zone at all, the left side should be fairly familiar, but I'll do a quick overview of it for you. The light blue boxes are what we refer to as the non-secure world. And the rich OS boxes would be uh, Linux instances or any other operating system that you're running in there. And then the dark blue boxes are the secure world, including the EL3, the firmware secure monitor, uh, a secure partition manager, the trusted OS, and the trusted services. All of those dark blue are in the trust in the secure world. So for our OS, we use Opti, the open source Opti OS, as the trusted OS. And the Veracruz runtime that I was speaking of runs as a trusted application inside secure EL0. And additional additional component is the untrusted pass-through, which runs as an app on top of the rich OS. So it's, it's, a, it's a Linux application. And this is, this is a big one, because right now we're all running on top of a QEMU virtual machine. This means this is a virtual machine, and it's, uh, so it's not a real hardware platform. And for our uh, Trust Zone Rust op, uh, support, we use the Rust Opti Trust Zone SDK. Um, this uh, cut off a lot of time on our, our development. It was, uh, it was uh, very useful for getting, getting things up and running with Rust. But we do have some limitations. Because we're running on the virtual QEMU platform, uh, we don't have any security uh, promises at all. This is just a demonstration platform. Also, inside the secure world, we're limited to approximately 22 megabytes of total WebAssembly binary plus the data size. Since we're on a virtual environment, we could increase this very easily. But to be fair, this is quite large compared to most trust zone environments. So uh, we could make it uh, we could make it bigger, but that would make it less realistic as well. So and additionally, on trust zone, uh, well, attestation is complicated. To be fair, we, we're lying about it here, partially because of the typical trust zone trust model especially the one supported by Opti, the main branch, is not quite appropriate to the use case. The trust zone trust model is based on loading signed trusted applications. It's not about loading uh, user provided applications. So we uh, have uh, basically faked attestation on this platform. It's not trusted, supported by the trusted OS or any manufacturing provisioning process. Um, uh, we could do this. In fact, I have uh, been told that Microsoft has a version of Opti that does support attestation, uh, but we haven't uh, prioritize that work at this point. So uh, caveat on Trust Zone, there's no security guarantees here. It is a demonstration. Now on to SGX. Uh, we're using SGX version 1.0, which uh, limits our enclaves to 120 megabytes, which about 96 megabytes of that is usable. We've tried, we thought about going to SGX version 2, but we couldn't, uh, we couldn't acquire a system at the time. And uh, since then, we could probably, I think we haven't checked lately. We could probably uh, get one now. But um, uh, we've dis we're, uh, we just, we've got limited uh, cycles, and so we haven't been able to do that. And we use the Rust SGX SDK for our Rust support of SGX. Now, um, as you may have seen previous, previously, uh, there's basically two main ways of running this with using their um, SGX STD and using Nostad. And then the other one is XArgo. Uh, we're using Nostad here, um, just to give you a point of reference. And the other supported platform is uh, the AWS Nitro Enclaves. Th these Nitro Enclaves are supported by AWS Nitro hardware. This is custom hardware that AWS has uh, designed themselves. Uh, one great, great thing about this is there's virtually no memory restrictions inside the Enclave. It's only limited by the EC2 instance type that you're running on. So if you've got 512 gigabytes of RAM on your instance type, you can do most of it. Probably not all of it because you still have to re reserve some for the non-secure world, but you can uh, apply most of it to uh, the Enclave. So um, that's one big plus. It runs on a stripped down Linux stack, which is inside the Enclave. That's a bit less good. It depends. Uh, but uh, I haven't. The, there's not a lot of, I haven't taken a close look at this stack, but having that much software in my TC trusted computing base makes me a little nervous. But for communication between the non-secure world and the secure world, they use raw sockets, which is... Uh, makes it very easy to write universal code that can work there or inside another virtual machine. It does 
create a few problems with, for example, uh, well, writing raw sockets means you have to uh, implement your own protocol or you have to use another protocol and it gets a bit um, error prone, I, I, I think is a good way to say that. So the Enclave itself runs on a reserve CPU that's inaccessible to the non-Enclave software. And one other constraint is that currently only one Enclave is allowed per EC2 instance. For our, for our use case, this was quite annoying. We did find a ways around it. If you look at their APIs and everything else, they do appear to plan on support. They do appear to plan on supporting multiple enclaves, but they don't at the moment. The other thing about Nitro enclaves, which uh, you may have seen if you've been following the chat, is uh, the nature of the trust relationship here is quite a bit different than it would be for SGX running on Azure or AMD SEV running on Google or anything else. Um, the promise of SGX is you don't have to trust the entity that owns and is actually and is running the, the hardware that you're running on. And same thing with AMD SEV. That's not the promise with AWS Enclaves. Uh, they they don't even they don't even claim to make that promise. AWS controls the firmware and the hardware that establishes your trust. They're doing the attestation. So if you don't trust AWS you probably shouldn't trust, if you don't want your data on AWS because you don't trust AWS, you probably shouldn't trust AWS Nitro Enclaves. But that being said, uh, I think that's probably a fairly limited use case. But in any case, that's something that uh, I, I don't I don't fault them for this. This was just a decision that they made and I, I think it makes sense for their business case. So next is the SEO4 microkernel. This is a software only solution. And the microkernel itself is, ver is formally verified. It's very high performance. And actually, this is currently part of another ARM research project. And I just talked to uh, the, uh, Nick on that today. And he said, I can talk about it. It's uh, called IceCap. And it has been open sourced. If you want a link, uh, hit me up and I can send it to you. It's sort of had a soft open source launch. So um, uh, once uh, that, uh, we plan to get that support into our tree. Right now, it's uh, on, a, on a branch. So I did a lot of hand waving in the, the fancy diagrams earlier. And so now I'm gonna talk about how we establish trust, uh, uh, transport security with an on, ephemeral enclave. So each client has an identity certif certificate and a key pair. That identity certificate is recorded in the policy, as I said earlier. The client provides that certificate during the TLS handshake, so we know who the participants are. The enclave itself, when it boots, generates a random key pair and a self-signed certificate. The policy, contains one and only one supported cipher suite. So if you wanna change the algorithm and get algorithm agility, you have to update your policy. This was a deliberate decision that we made. And so, but how do we, the establish the clients themselves establish trust in that enclave self-signed certificate? For that, we use attestation. So here, um, uh, if you've uh, d uh, done any attestation before, this will be fairly, uh, fairly simple, uh, I mean, fairly familiar. We've got the attestation service on the top, which has a device public key associated with each target, each host system. Um, we've got on the client, we've got the client certificate, and then we've got the host. This is the system running Veracruz. We've got a target enclave on the host, which when it boots, generates a random key, key pair and a self-signed certificate. And also on the host in the enclave, we've got the device private key, which is uh, provisioned at manufacturing time. So the protocol starts with the, the, the client issuing a challenge. From that, a token is generated, and in that token is the uh, hash of the self-signed certificate uh, uh, that was generated. And then finally, it's signed by the device private key, and the challenge is placed in there, and then it's returned to the client. The client then takes that token and the received certificate, takes a token and sends it to the attestation service, and he receives a pass-fail response. And it may also contain other information that the attestation service was able to glean from the token that, that they might find interesting. At that point, then the client verifies that the challenge is correct, checks the measurements inside the token against its expectations in its policy. It decides if it can trust it, and then it calculates the hash of the certificate that it received, compares it against the hash in the token, and then adds the certificate to, the, to, to its trusted certificates. At that point, then, the client can issue a TLS client hello, send its client certificate across. The target enclave will respond with its self-signed certificate with a TLS server hello. From then on, We've got a TLS channel, and that's how we establish the trust. Now, we're going to add a few wrinkles here because, as I told you, we support multiple platforms. So this all works when there's one attestation service and one type of platform, an SGX target system that you support. But what if we have two different platform types with two different attestation services? This is a fake, not a realistic trust zone attestation service because it doesn't really exist at this point, but imagine the scenario. 
Or maybe we've got three different systems with uh, different attestation processes. Now the client software needs to maintain support for multiple protocols, maintain trust relationships and credentials with multiple attestation services, and must maintain a policy on which configurations to trust for each of them. Now, if we add more client instances, each of which must maintain a policy, a consistent policy about what configurations of which platforms to trust, things start to look a little complicated. So what we did is we added another service, of course. Um, this one though, uh, is the one ring to, to rule them all. This places all of the complexity for supporting these multiple platforms in one place using one set of credentials for each of the services and provides one place to maintain the policy. So what does attestation look like now with this proxy service? Uh, note inside the target system, we've added a, uh, a new app called the root app. When it boots, this is uh, the root app generates a public private key pair. This is different from the one before, and we refer to it here as the proxy public private key pair. First, it starts with the proxy service itself issuing uh, what, what we basically starting what we call uh, the native attestation, which by issuing a challenge. But now the additional info field on the certificate contains a new device generated public key, the proxy public key. The rest goes on as before with the proxy service continuing to stand in as the client. When the proxy service has established trust in the token, it adds the target's proxy public key to its own internal database. Next, when the Veracruz application launches, as before, inside the Enclave, it generates a public-private key pair as, uh, as before and a self-signed certificate. Next, the client performs an attestation. In our implementation, this is PSA attestation, um, uh, which is an ARM uh, attestation protocol. But this time it's against the Veracruz application instead of the root app. This works as before now, except when we're taking the app measurement instead of the root enclave measurement. But note that the signature of the token is, uh, is generated with the proxy private key instead of the device private key as before. This allows the client to ask the proxy attestation service to authenticate the token. As I said before, there's multiple advantages than this and that the client doesn't even know, need to know about the multiple, multiple attestation services. The client need only support the PSA attestation protocol. And the client in general doesn't necessarily have to know about the details of uh, what it trusts inside the different systems. It can, it can, doesn't have to, but it can abstract those and basically have the proxy out assertion service takes care, care of it. And that policy enforcement can be maintained and executed in one place. So uh, that's what we refer to as proxy attestation. And uh, we have a few tweaks to this uh, planned in the coming weeks. Um, uh, and um, if you want to talk to talk about them, uh, we can get into it, but I do want to uh, leave room for the rest of the material. So if you want to talk offline with me about that, uh, please hit me up. So, as I said before, uh, we support uh, inside Veracruz, the programs that we're running are in WebAssembly. So uh, if you haven't been paying attention, WebAssembly is to the previous talks that talked about WebAssembly. As I said, it's, pro it's the new hotness these days. So um, uh, it's a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Think about it as a, as a new and improved uh, JVM, uh, Java bytecode is a good way to think about it. So, uh, but it's not, I mean, that's a lot of hand waving. Don't, 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 don't at me on that. But uh, so it's primarily intended as a replacement for JavaScript for performance critical applications. That's where it started. But it's been gaining traction on server side because it's got very good sandboxing features. It's agnostic to the programming language being used. You can write it in any language, and, and if you've got an LLVM backend uh, compiler for that language, it can compile to to, to uh, WebAssembly. It's got platform independent execution. And the system interaction is controlled by the WebAssembly runtime, whichever one you're using. So it's highly portable. So why did we use WebAssembly? Uh, first, the first problem, which is why we went there in the first place, is that SGX 1.0 didn't let you easily load software after the Enclave was started. So um, uh, we didn't really wanna do all the dangerous things you might have to do with page flags to uh, enable write it executable and all that. So um, if you don't want to do that, the entire program that you're executing needs to be run known when the Enclave starts. So this prevented runtime loading of encrypted programs. Second problem, protect the Enclave environment from uninspectable, possibly malicious programs loaded at runtime. And this is where the sandboxing of WASM is helpful. Um, uh, 
that we need to protect the Veracruz execution code from any bugs we might have in our in, uh, handling of that program. And third, um, as you noticed, our supported enclaves, they run an x86 and a 64 so the portability of the enclave program was a desirable feature. So the history of WebAssembly on Veracruz, it originally started with running uh, the WASM on a formally proven custom virtual machine. Um, uh, this was a very interesting project. It uh, resulted in a lot of interesting work, but it did have some very poor performance. And it was also extremely time consuming to develop the formally proven aspects of it. Um, uh, we have we have people who have a lot of background in formal formal methods, but it was uh, it was just very time consuming. So right now we're using the WASMI interpreter on most of our platforms. Um, the reason we're using an interpreter and the WASMI interpreter is uh, is written in Rust. So interpreters tend to be simpler than JIT compilers, so it reduces the size of our trusted computing base. Uh, but to be fair, they are slower than JITs. Um, but one side effect maybe is that uh, they are perhaps a little harder to write a specter attack against than uh, a JIT. But um, uh, that's not proven yet, but it's uh, something that uh, we've been thinking about. So anyway, so we do have JIT available on the SEL4 kernel. Uh, it's been a slow turn desire with some work on trying to get the JIT implemented on the other platforms. But uh, our SGX environment uses Rust Lang's no, SD, no STD feature, which I mentioned. So it makes that a bit little difficult because of the dependency. If you were here for the presentation on the Rust SGX SDK, he did mention that the dependencies get to be quite difficult when you're trying to do uh, add new dependencies. They've added a lot of great dependencies in their repo that um, just work for you. But if you need anything that's not in there, it gets complicated really fast. Additionally, uh, on the other platform, uh, Trust Zone, the memory constraints also made it difficult. That being said, uh, running an AWS Nitro Enclave should be uh, quite easy to get a JIT working in there. So our interface for our applications, um, uh, I would say what our interfaces are right now is a custom interface, but we are working to, towards, and we've got a pull request in there now to support WASI for the uh, web WebAssembly interfaces to the system. Um, WASI, as mentioned before, is a POSIX-like standard for WASM programs to interact with it. So we're currently implementing just a limited WASI layer, and usually this is fo focused on the file interfaces, where we're creating a file in-memory file system uh, kept in, in ephemeral RAM inside the Enclave. So uh, we've talked about, and we have interest in swapping that RAM out to non-Enclave RAM, or even swapping it out to um, uh, the non-Enclave file system for longer storage. But uh, that'll, that's currently on hold because we don't currently have a compelling use case for it. And we've got a lot on our hands. So um, now as far as future work, um, we, uh, we're open source and we want your help. We've got a number of issues um, on our repo. Some of them are marked as a good first issue. If, you're, uh, if you want to contribute or you just want to look around, please, please take a look because uh, we can use all the help we can get. But as far as moving forward, uh, one of the things that we don't like about what we currently have, and I can say this about the policy files since I'm, uh, it was my idea, policy files are really static. They're hard to set up, and um, uh, they, we want something more dynamic. So may, if you uh, were following some of the other discussions, you can look at some of those projects. They've got a little bit more of a dynamic policy, which I think is something we would like to emulate. We'd like support for streaming computations, which is part of that WASI work that I mentioned earlier. We want to also want to enable multi-isolate, multi-TEE use cases, so we could basically do a privacy-preserving grid computation. Um, one big ask is uh, we want to uh, that we are still not we we want to do dynamic checking of the runtime take behavior of the program. Um, one question you may ask is how do, uh, we saw earlier is how do the data providers know that the computation that's being done by this secret program is the computation that they want or that they expect or that they contracted with? And that is the only way that we can enable that right now is for them to be able to inspect the code, which means that it's no longer secret from them. So the program provider would have to share the code with the um, with the data providers, which is something that's allowed, but it uh, reduces the security promise. Um, all of those can still be maintained secret from the operator of the platform, but we still would like a system that would allow to uh, the um, the data providers to be able to check the runtime behavior of the program without actually seeing it. That's obviously a capital H hard problem, but it's interesting. 
Additionally, a lot of the use cases that we are interested in would involve an external database. And anytime there's an external database be being queried by a program, there's queried or even uh, updated, uh, there's opportunity for side channels. And that's something that we would like to avoid. So um, we haven't solved this problem yet. This is another capital H hard problem, but I think it's very interesting. Um, and we're also working with a few collaborators on real world use cases. But uh, if you're interested in talking to us about it, um, uh, we're always open to more.